नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सुत नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सुत नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सुत so uh, as you all know that there are uh, four stages uh, one is uh, the sotapanna sakdagami uh, anagami and arahant so there is a, a slight uh, uh, variation to that uh, which the buddha uh, gives in this sutta so it is kind of interesting sutta uh, so we we'll started this is uh, in uh, i think uh, angutra nikaya 88 so this uh, should be in the book of threes i think so book of threes so i'll i'll uh, confirm uh, later uh, which book uh, but the uh, sutta is 88 the process of training this is about the training but uh, there is one interesting point because every one, uh, one half month more than 150 uh, training rules come up for recitation clansmen who desire their own goal train in this so now uh, over here uh, what is, uh, the buddha is referring to is patimukha the vinaya the the monk rules the uh, the buddha would give monk rules as and when required so uh, at uh, at the current point of time uh, it is 227 rules but at that point of time maybe it is 150 but there is one other view also of the rules that uh, of the 227 rules 157 are uh, the rules for the monks and 75 uh, 75 uh, rules are uh, uh, rules which are uh, for uh, the the process of training correct this is the one so the, uh, the other uh, which are the rules are uh, the rules for uh, saman eras so uh, or the rules of conduct how you should conduct yourself outside uh, when you are going how you should conduct yourself so uh, it can be uh, 157 plus uh, 75 and 227 and uh, uh, it can be also considered to be uh, in this banner uh, which is uh, that uh, it is 152 rules or more than 150 rules for the monks which are getting recited these are all comprised within this three trainings what three the training in the higher virtuous behavior the training in the higher mind and the training in the higher wisdom these are the three trainings in which all these are comprised here because a bhikkhu fulfills virtuous behavior concentration and wisdom he falls into offenses in regard to the lesser and minor training rules and rehabilitates himself for what reason because i have not said that he is incapable of this but in regard to those training rules that are fundamental to the spiritual life in conformity with the spiritual life in his behavior is constant and steadfast so now uh, important thing what the buddha is saying is that there are rules where if you break them you can uh, take uh, you can restore yourself um uh, that is that you confess that you have done this and uh, also uh, reiterate that you will not do it in the uh, future then there are rules where you have to give up say you got a robes uh, and the rains retreats uh, that that robe had to be completed uh, in the one month period if that is not possible then you give up that robe so by uh, relinquishing something also you restore your uh, by uh, if you have broken the rule you restore yourself so there are certain ways uh, where you take up punishment say uh, like uh, you give up your seniority for a month or something like that and you stand last in the line for uh, while receiving food so those are the things where you do a offense and then that offense can be uh, with a uh, suitable punishment or confession can be restored and then there are rules which are fundamental which are the four parajika rules so those rules if you do then there is no restoration the moment you do the rules you are no longer a monk and you cannot become a monk in that lifetime so that is what this is being referring to having an undertaken the training rule he trains them with the destruction of taints and he realizes for himself with direct knowledge in this very life the taintless liberation of mind liberation by wisdom and having entered upon it he dwells in it if he does not attain and penetrate this 
what uh, he is saying that if a person uh, or a monk uh, does not become a arahant in this life with the utter destruction of five lower fetters he is an attainer of nibbana in the interval if he does not attain and uh, penetrate this with the utter destruction of five lower he is a attainer of nibbana upon landing now i have a uh, few times explained how when you are a <coughs> uh, uh anagami you can attain uh, in the interval means when the consciousness leaves the body but before it uh, arrives at the brahma loka in the interval you will uh, attain your liberation that is one uh, time you can do it then upon arriving on arriving on the uh, brahma loka your consciousness leaves the body and arrives at the brahma loka at that point of arrival you attain arahanthood and attainer uh, upon landing and attainer of nibbana with exertion and attainer of nibbana to exertion uh, one bound upstream heading towards the akinta rem so that is uh, he does uh, uh, arrive at the uh, the consciousness arrives at the brahma loka the there is a little bit of effort and he attains uh, nibbana he has to uh, do a middling effort and he attains nibbana or he has to go through one and other five uh, of the uh, brahma lokas and he attains uh, arahanthood if he does not attain and penetrate this with the utter destruction of three fetters with the diminishing of greed hatred and delusion okay so there is a diminishing of the heat great hatred and delusion and then there is a destruction of the three fetters the destruction of three fetters is sota banna but uh, if you have a diminishing of greed hatred delusion he is a once returner who after coming back to this world only one more time makes an end of suffering so uh, the sota banna is there then there is a uh, sakdagami sakdagami will come back only once in, in uh, and then he will attain uh, arahanthood if he does not attain and penetrate this with the utter destruction destruction of three fetters he is a one seed attainer <coughs> who after being reborn once more in human existence makes an end of suffering he will does not attain and penetrate this with the utter destruction of three fetter he is a family to family attainer who after roaming and wandering on among good families two or three times make an end of suffering so buddha is giving a, a kind of a new uh, this thing uh, option of a uh, sotapanna of a sotapanna who will uh, come back uh, in human form two or three times and attain arahanthu so in sotapanna the standard uh, uh, explanation given by the buddha is that he, uh, no more than seven lives that does not mean that he has to live for seven lives but it is no more than seven lives it can be one life also and at that uh, uh, rebirth he may be uh, attaining arahanthood but no uh, it may not take more than seven lives but over here he is giving a new option or a new category uh, or he, he is uh, maybe clarifying a bit about the sotapanna he is saying that Uh, with utter destruction of three fetters he is a family to family attainer who after roaming and wandering on among good families two or three times make an end of suffering if he does not attain and penetrate this with the utter destruction of three fetters he is a seven times at most attainer who after roaming and wandering on among devas and humans seven times at most make an end to suffering so he, uh, over here he benches devas also and uh, human births also uh, the uh, maximum uh, can be seven so one other thing uh, in the uh, sutras one of the things uh, the buddha has mentioned is that once uh, a person uh, uh, attains an uh, uh, sotapanna even if he ha- he is extremely negligent he will not see an earth eighth bird so it uh, is explained as a bent of mind say uh, your, your mind is inclined to certain things and once uh, that certain things uh, your mind is bent to eventually your mind will go towards that that is the 
destruction of uh, greed, hatred, and delusion. So that is a bent of mind you uh, attain at the time of being a sotapanna. And the three fetters are destroyed, like uh, your belief that uh, by doing rituals you will become uh, awakened. So you will burn something, or you will uh, go in, into this river and dip yourself, or you will offer this uh, uh, dev or uh, deity uh, this amount of uh, offerings. And you will become uh, awakened. That uh, concept has been destroyed in you. That fetter has been destroyed in you. Then the other fetter uh, which has been destroyed is doubt that this thing which you are doing, the Buddha's teaching, would lead you to the Nibbana. So the doubt of that, you may still have doubt, uh, like Bhante says, uh, you may have still a doubt that you want a, a vanilla ice cream or a chocolate ice cream when two uh, are offered. But that does not mean that all doubts are over. But the doubt that this path will take you to the end of your suffering, that doubt has been destroyed. Now the third is that you get insight into the impersonal nature of human. Uh, but that does not mean that you fully understand the uh, impersonal nature. Even an uh, anagami has a little bit of uh, conceit. So uh, that uh, that means that uh, one uh, example is given by uh, when Anuruddha is speaking to uh, Sariputta and he says that I can uh, see 10,000 worlds and what is happening. I can hear what is happening over there. I can see what is happening for the 10,000 world systems. I can uh, like a person can snap a finger and be there. I can go there. So, but I am not able to uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, go to the next level. So the Sariputta says that the saying that I have that capability is also a conceit in you. That I am able to see the 10,000 systems. I am able to uh, go and I am able to do this uh, psychic feats is also a, a conceit in you. Uh, and one other uh, 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 anagami uh, monk uh, explains that it is like taking a white cloth and you uh, muddy the white cloth and then wash and clean and uh, do a lot of things with the uh, uh, to clean the cloth. Okay, but the cloth is white, but it is not that kind of white which was the previous white when the uh, the cloth was originally uh, made. Because there is a difference uh, of a taint uh, of a self, uh, which remains like the taint which remains in the white cloth, which has been washed. But it is not the same kind of wash. So there is a, a certain uh, amount of uh, conceit which remains even in an anagami. So <coughs> you cannot expect that uh, Sotapanna will have complete understanding of not self, but he has an insight in the not self. He knows that uh, this is whatever it, this is, is not the complete thing. So this is an interesting part I found uh, that uh, in this sutta. It's a small sutta, so I said uh, till Sister Kema comes, we can uh, do this sutta. I see he, she's here. I'm here. You have joined? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, then, uh, you can take <laughs> Wait a sec. I, yeah, I am. <laughs> this was quite so an experience. Take, uh, take it forward, yeah. uh, now, I'm a little confused. Can I ask you something? Okay, yeah. so, um, you know, one of the children, there's four children, I was saying to somebody, there is, uh, there is um, Sotapanna child, and then there is Sakadagami, there is Anagami and Arahat. This is where one person was explaining it to me. But um, are we eliminating Sakadagami? Because nobody likes to talk about the middle child in families, and it's like they no, don't. Sakadagami, I, I repeat if you if you want to repeat, I'll, I'll repeat the Shabdagami. No, but, but, uh, what, does, but huh? what, oh, mm -hmm. so you were saying, I, I thought I heard you say that with, with Sotapanna, that all the craving could be gone. And that only happened, no. I don't quite understand. That's very different than- It does not go, that is what I'm saying. With uh, uh, Sotapanna, it does not go. Even right. in Arhant, the self view is there, okay? So- Yeah, look, uh, look here, wait, wait, look here uh, a minute. Does this, does it agree with this? Because this is the- this is the one I, um, let's get rid of this. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Come on. You can come on. I give you permission. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, no. See, this page is what I like to send to people because this um, this was an article put together by a monk. It's taken from his article, and then I try to explain to people the levels. Okay, and on here, the person loses any skeptical doubt about the fact that there really is a path to nibbana. That's the right. first one. Second one, the person gives dependence on rites and rituals gives up their dependence on rites and rituals to reach Nibbana is the second one. Third one is realize the delusion of a personal self of taking everything personally, but this is not completely released quite yet. So that's, that's the same. It agrees with that. I'm yes, always hunting yeah. for stuff that agrees. Yeah. <laughs> and Sakadagami weakens the craving for sense pleasure. And, no, and then noticeably you uh, reduce the thoughts and acts of cruelty and ill will. That it very noticeably. And then Anagami lets go of craving for divine existence in heavenly realms of subtle forms like Dev Deva Lokas, because that can become like an addiction and let go of the craving for divine existence in immaterial realms like the Brahma Lokas. Same thing. It becomes a point of lust and craving. No, no, no. This, this is uh, uh, at the stage of Arahant the person gives up. Well, they let go of the craving, they start to let go of the craving and let go of all conceit and sloth and torpor. That not is uh, the non- That is uh, uh, this no, the Arahant. Non oh, well, see, this was in his thesis. He did this one. And then Arahat mm -hmm. was restlessness is now completely gone. Ignorance is totally gone. That were the last yeah. two. Five fetters are uh, very, uh, this is, uh, five fetters are uh, very clear. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the the uh, the those fetters which are given after the five fetters because over here in this sutta also uh, Buddha mentions clearly about the five fetters. Five fetters are uh, the same three fetters in the uh, anagami, and then uh, uh, the, the, there is so a maybe last. maybe what we should change that in is, this one is they they let and last. They, they let, uh, and last. heavier uh, heavier release of craving. Heavier release of craving. Uh, ill will and lust is the two things which goes uh, as a anagami. Heavier release of craving for divine. Yeah, this is incorrect. Huh? This is incorrect because all these five uh, should be uh, at an arhan stage. All these five should be at the arahant. No, stage. no, the sakadagami is weakening of craving and sense pleasures. Yeah, there's there's a process here. You have you still have the craving and clinging in sodapana, but you weaken it in the sakadagami, weakening weakening craving and clinging, and then in amigami, it's a heavier release of craving for for even even for uh, well, craving. Even this is technically uh, it is only two things which are released. Uh, at the uh, after sakadagami when you become anagani uh, you have weakened uh, the ill will and you have weakened the lust so uh, ill will and lust goes away oh he was pointing out that conceit is therefore gone and no no no, no. conceit goes at a stage of uh, an, uh, arahant only so the conceit is that the the uh, uh, life for immaterial worlds. So like you want to you want to make three of them in the arahat? You want to put three yeah, of them and down physical, there? physical, uh, like uh, yeah, all of them. Okay, five of them right. to, no, no. <laughs> We have to talk about this later. This is okay. something I've been using for a long time, but I I just need to um, uh, just. Um, uh, stop this one for a minute. But this this is a kind of interesting. It is uh, uh, giving all the stages in one sutta and also yeah. uh, kind of gives an interesting point about the Vinaya rules. So 152 rules or 227 rules because See, when some he, of the monks when in he, uh, Thailand have uh, started okay. to uh, recite 152 rules. Huh. When, when he was talking about this, um, he was, um, wait a minute. He was saying there are three levels to this release. The uh, Vitkakama, vit, vit, I can't read this, Vitkakama level. This mm -hmm. is where the tendencies motivate unwholesome bodily and verbal actions. Usually this is where the beginner starts. And Parayutana level, where this is where the tendencies rise up to obsess this and enslave. Like Abhidhamma or uh, Vishuddhimadha, I think. Uh, He's Thai. He's okay. Thai. Yeah. So they become uh, very complicated also <clears throat> because in the suttas it is more uh, simple. Like this sutta, it is very simple. Uh, ex explanation is very simple. 
But I think, I think that 10 fetters are disagreeing with your 10 fetters to start out within this, which is something we need to look at later because the way he says the delusion of the personal self, the doubt, the mere rites and rituals, the first got it, got it, got it. three, then craving for sense pleasure, thoughts and acts of ill will and cruelty. Got it, got it, huh? that craving for divine existence in heavenly realms and devilism conceit is seven sloth and torpor and dull mind is eight and restlessness is the last uh yeah. the ninth and one and ignorance is the tenth. Huh? all right so somehow at the bottom i need to straighten this out because i'm yeah. not giving good information we need to blow over that that's all to become weak in uh, sakdagami and go away in uh, anagami that, uh, but that poor <laughs> Poor Sakadagami on the on the long haul in people's books almost never gets mentioned. I tell yeah. you, yeah. <laughs> so, so like, just like just like there were three three girls in my family, and the middle sister was never mentioned. <laughs> she was really bitter about that. <laughs> That's funny, you know. All right, so um, I had um, let's see what else was here. Uh, a Sunday class thing. Does anybody have any questions for Bonte before I? take you on yeah. this little journey. I think we still have time to do it. We're going to go till what, till four o'clock is right, I think. Is that right? I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yes. okay, so we can do that. All right. Um, does, questions for Vante first? Questions? Anybody? Okay. okay. Okay, well, you know, I got this bee in my bonnet for the last two days. That means I have an idea running around inside my head, the bee in the bonnet. <laughs> And then it stung me today and I started writing. And, um, you know, I was going through several things I brought back with me from books that I brought back from uh, Damasuka with me that I didn't have here, I wanted. And one of those books was Moving Dhamma number two. And in the back of that book, there is a story about Bantia. And I didn't know as if everybody here has uh, gone probably through to the website and listened to his story at all. But this is a little capsule one that's in the back about the author. And it, it does hit on the prime things. And I thought that I would just uh, let you see this. And then I would talk to you a little bit about why do I think my teacher had a brilliance that nobody else had in the last 20 years? <laughs> You know, a little bit of conceit there, not conceit, but pride, you know, that he was able, uh, almost as a disabled person, I'll go into that later, but, you know, uh, because he's an American and he's, he, he didn't grow up a Buddhist is what I'm talking about and stuff like that, uh, you know, how did he manage this whole thing to do this? So I will talk to you about how did the retreats come into being in the way that they are constructed? And I think people ask me about that. And right now we face some new teachers coming in and we face a new, new uh, teacher that will be at the center this summer. But I would like to just try to explain how that came about so that people understand why did he teach all those retreats in that particular order and what was the point behind it? But first I want you to understand about Bon TV Mila Ramsey a little bit more. So I'm going to read you uh, this little capsule that's back here. Most venerable Bhante Vimala Ramsey Mahatera was born in New York and grew up in Chicago and then California. He did his first insight meditation retreat in California at the age of 28. And subsequently, he became a Buddhist monk in 1986 because of his keen interest in meditation. It was, I'm going to throw in at this little point here that he became a Buddhist monk because his first teacher he was involved with for almost two years was, um, uh, was um, the late ven most venerable uh, Bhante Us Usilananda Mahatera. And that was at the Half Moon Bay in California underneath the Burmese line. And he came in in the Burmese line following the Mahasi style. That's where he comes as far as lineage is concerned. That's my lineage too. We come down that way. Okay. And so we come in that way. Subsequently, he became the Buddhist monk in 1986 uh, because of his keen interest in the meditation, largely because of the influence of uh, Usilananda also. And he went on to Burma in 1988 
to practice intensive meditation at the famous meditation center, Mahasi Yikta in Rangoon. Now I'm not sure about this part, but I think he's coming back to the same one later uh, and not a different one, which they say Chamye uh, Yikta. The first one was Mahasi Yikta. Okay, but uh, Bhante then traveled to Malaysia uh, after his first visit to one of the centers and practiced loving kindness meditation extensively for six months. In 1990, Bhante went back to Burma for more of the Pasana meditation and for 14 to 16 hours of meditation a day at Chamye Yekta in Rangoon. He practiced for two years sometimes sitting in meditation as long as seven or eight hours a sitting. And after two years of intensive meditation and experiencing what, he, what was said to be the final result according to the Burmese line, uh, he became very disillusioned with the straight Vipassana method and he left Burma to continue his search. He moved around at that point. This one doesn't tell you, but he went to visit several different teachers that were master teachers that were still left. They had not died yet. And he got to, um, he tells me, he told me the story once of going to see one who would not speak to him. And he was absolutely silent for almost two months or so before the teacher said a word to him. But he was determined he was not going to break silence at all until uh, the etiquette was complete. It was <laughs> really interesting. He went to Malaysia again and began teaching loving kindness meditation. And that was in, um, in 1995 uh, when Bunty was invited to live and teach at Brickfields, which is the largest, um, the Maha Buddhist Vihara in Brick Brickfields. It's a section of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and the largest Theravadan monastery at the time in Malaysia directed by most venerable Keshri Dhammananda Mahatera. And then um, venerable Keshri was so impressed by Bhante's knowledge of how he had gathered information. And a lot of that had to do with how Usonanda had worked with him about investigating stuff. And then he had, he had him take over some of his talks and teaching schedule at the temple, which was highly unusual. And if we have some pictures of when he was there, he was the only Western monk that was in the pictures. So you can see where people might not have appreciated this, this uh, person from the West getting close to the abbot and talking to him every morning. And those sessions in the morning were special because I've heard it from Bhante, but I've also heard it from people at Brickfields when I was giving talks there a couple of years back that they he used to hang out with the abbot in the morning for about a half an hour and they would just be laughing in the room laughing and smiling in the room before they went to breakfast <laughs> it's like and he was that kind of you know person very open hearted uh bunty Keshu uh, Damananda and bunty subsequently met with a venerable Sri Lankan monk at Brickfield's temple, and I'll tell you now who that is. It doesn't say it here, but that was Dr. Punaji Mahatera, who re he died a few years back, and he was one of the first um, Mahatera monks I ever knew at Washington Buddhist Vihara in 2000. And I got to see him a few times over the years, but uh, then I was there for his 88th birth, 84th or 88th birthday, I think it was, at at. Um, Brickfields, and then it was about a year later he had died. So Bhante subsequently met with him, and he told him that he was teaching meditation correctly. Bhante was teaching uh, metta at that point. He was not willing to teach the breathing meditation because of what happened in Burma. And but uh, to stop referencing, he suggested he stop referencing or speaking through the Vasudhimaga because while he was in Burma, everyone was trained on the Vasudhimaga and all our language came out coming from the Vasudhimaga. And um, just, uh, he suggested he just go back to the suttas and he is the one who introduced to Bhante the 1995 uh, version, which was the first edition of the, Maha, the uh, Majima Nikaya 
uh, translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And this, this is like a door opening for him because when he went to that book and he picked it up, the, everything started to open up for him as he began to study the suttas that were pointing to the meditation support in that book. And thus Bhante then began to study the sutta texts more thoroughly to practice meditation according to these texts was his determination. And after a three month self retreat, and that was done in a cave in Thailand, where he said to K. Sri Dhammananda, to the venerable, I need to go and do a private retreat. And he said, okay, go for a, a month or so. <laughs> and he went to Thailand to where he knew there was a good, uh, you know, a good cave with electricity like in it and a way to have water, okay, and get support for food. And he set up himself in that cave along with the cobra, if you've ever heard the story of him living in the cave with the cobra. And cobra stays on this side, Bonte stays on that side, and they're very respectful to each other. And... Um, the thing is, he didn't exactly come back to Malaysia. They went and got him because, because the abbot, K. Sri Dhammananda, said, where, where is he? And they said, he's still there. And he sent someone there to tell him, please come back. And so he came back to Malaysia. And then he wrote the book on mindfulness of breathing called the Anapanasati Sutta, colon, a practical guide for mindfulness of breathing and tranquil wisdom meditation. And that was the first book, the notorious book. When I came and got involved in this in 2000, this book had been printed by Bonte with a few thousand, just a few thousand copies. But I started to investigate the book and what happened to it. And the book literally didn't want to be disturbed. It was doing just fine and was being uh, reprinted by several groups. And, but the interesting thing is we discovered something. He didn't know it had ever been reprinted. And some strange things had happened when university printed thousands of copies of it as a training manual for breathing meditation. And another situation where there were groups on the Eastern seaboard who thought that ooh, Vimala Ramsey, which is who the author was, ooh, meaning venerable Bhante Vimala Ramsey. That's the vener means venerable Bhante Vimala Ramsey or venerable Vimala Ramsey. Um, instead of saying venerable, you would say ooh, in the Burmese tradition. So ooh, Vimala Ramsey was the author and they thought he was dead. So they didn't have to find him to ask permission and they just kept reprinting this book. Never made a penny on this book. It was for free distribution. The book just kept multiplying. And on the last time I checked, uh, this was um, before we left the mountain in Lesterville, uh, Missouri, we were on the first location so it would have been about 2004. At that point, we had documented, it had over 600,000 copies floating around the world. And then when an interesting tidbit here, an interesting note is when um, Lucille Ananda died in California at Half Moon Bay, when Bonte was taking care of him, he was getting things from his office and taking it to him at the hospital and caring for him at the hospital uh, through the night shift so that no women needed to touch him at all. That's what this was about. And Bonte had worked in elderly, you know, retirement homes and nursing homes before. He knew what to do and they allowed him to take care of, of, um, of Usil Ananda through the night at the hospital before he came back to the temple. And while I was talking to him and everything, he found out and while he was going in the, into his office and coming back and forth, he discovered that Usul Ananda had been placing the book in as many libraries as he possibly could all over the world. And so there's another piece to the story where Mark Johnson and Elaine Johnson, where Mark Edsel Johnson wrote the authoritative work on the, um, the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation for his thesis, he got involved with me when he was hiking in the Himalaya mountains. 
And that summer when he was hiking in the Himalaya mountains, he came upon a temple and he and his wife stopped there and he was fishing around their little library and he found this book, this tiny little book of 90 pages. Um, and it was this book that he found. How did it get into this library in the top of the world in the Himalaya mountains? We don't know, but we have found the book over time in so many different places, it's always there. The book has now been, had been revised at the time of this writing and this, this, um, this book would have been like 2015, they did, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2006 or so, right. Um, and, and when they did this, they had also produced The Breath of Love. And The Breath of Love was a reprint of the um, original Anapanasati book with a changed uh, introduction in the front. Then Bhante Vimala Ramsey came back to the USA in 1998 and he had been teaching meditation throughout the country since then. And in uh, 2003, uh, he co-founded the United International Buddha Dhamma Society with myself and another monk, uh, Bhante Paniloka from Nepal. And originally the, the founding of UIBDS um, was the corporate name. Uh, the first and only main project it had was to construct and build the Dhammasukha Meditation Center, which is located now in Annapolis, Missouri, USA. And he teaches now uh, meditation from May through October each year. Originally, it was incorporated as a Virginia corporation, but when the land was uh, intended for us to do this showed up. The, it was reincorporated in um, 2005, I think. We reincorporated it underneath, um, it could have been 2003, but I'm not real sure, uh, in a Missouri corporation where it stands now. The original reason for setting it up was the influence for that came from Bhante Paniloka from Nepal and uh, Kathmandu. And the reason he felt in his heart, somebody needs to do this, an American monk needs to do this, so that when American monks get involved in all of this Buddhism and they come back to their country, the way we come back to our country, they can retire or live in a place where everyone speaks English and the language, their mother tongue. Whereas he knew very well, there were many monks in the United States who had to stay only at foreign temples and who were uncomfortable with the setup for the rest of your life being in that situation where it's like you're talked around. It's like you're almost not there when there's a lot of other monks involved. And he really thought this should happen. And this is why Damasuka originally, when it was built, was with intention for a 12-year plan that included a monastic side and a lay side very distinctly. And the, the intention was to create, um, to take the practice and to build it in a way where it could go back to as many lay people as possible, but also that it could be given to the Sangha construction of the Sangha, because the Sangha has a, a modern issue of survival with its four requisites and being able in most countries to live under the vinya properly and to be supported with just the four requisites in a place that is secure. And that's what was done. But it didn't turn out that there were a lot of open-minded monks who wanted to come and try anything other than the mainstream meditation that was happening. And so it didn't happen quite the way it was intended. But we did have an English program for several years and there were three or four monks that went through that program for learning to teach the Dhamma in English uh, that were foreign monks, but it didn't have so many uh, American monks uh, come through. Anyway, he then what happened was he teaches his meditation from May through October each year. These are the years when we're traveling and teaching that that, that means he's staying for the rains retreat every year. We were staying at Damasuka. 
And the balance of the year is spent traveling around the world, giving retreats where asked to come and to give talks at universities and different organizations. He is, he, at this time of the writing of this, he was the first United States representative to the World Buddhist Council of Kobe, Japan, and was installed in that position in 2007. He has since resigned from that. Many of the Westerners did resign from that program uh, simply because it was just not quite what it said it was. I'm not sure how to put it, but um, it has certainly got a lot of money involved and it is building very grand buildings, very grand university, very grand everything. But being built in Japan, the chances of most of the population in the world or most of the 570 million Buddhists in the world is they don't have the money to go visit Japan. It's pretty clear. So how that all comes down, I, I don't know how it will go, but it, it was like, um, we finally, he decided that he would resign from that organization and put more time into Dhammasukha. So if you'd like to come and go and visit Bunty's website or information, of course, you know, you can go to check out the videos and other retreats at Dhammasukha and YouTube.com, there was a YouTube and a Facebook uh, was created for Bonte uh, that is managed by David Johnson and was developed really, really well and helped in a tremendous growth has happened since David has been managing the center. And I basically in 2014 left um, the responsibilities I had in, in Damasuka and, and David took over primarily to run the the retreats and Bonte was teaching, but we were still traveling because Bonte had asked me in Japan at one of the conferences if I would go to Asia and the rest of the story you know, where I'm in Asia and Bonte Damagavesi is a monk who got involved with Bonte along this whole history and became the other person in Asia working together to develop a, a hold in in Asia so it doesn't disappear. I'm gonna take you now um, to over to the um, share, if I can find it. I'm not, not sure what happened to it, there it is, okay. And, and uh, go through this document. Uh, and what this is, many people ask me, how did Bonte Vina Lorenzi begin teaching TWIM and how did he create such a progressive retreat where people, don't get tired and are encouraged to smile and feel lighter and happier. And many times they continue to take this home with them to use all the time. How did it happen? It happened gradually and it happened over the years. And I was privileged to train with Bonte, but it was an unusual training. Uh, the only reason that it happened the way it did was there were no men forthcoming anywhere who were willing to leave completely their jobs and occupations to travel full time to do what he wanted to have happen. And the world was just at that time in a position where I could uh, basically close down my business and pack up and say, I'm gonna do this. It was a choice of, am I gonna go back to college and try to study? And this would have been um, in 2000. At that time, there were not major programs for Theravada Buddhism to be studied. There was only Mahayana. In the situation in the United States, traditionally from the time Buddhism came to the United States, was set up in a, it evolved in a, a particular way. Okay, and the, um, the Mahayanas show up first and the Mahayanas decided the best way to handle this is to get all of the professorships in the United States in Buddhist studies departments are held, were held at the time I was thinking about going back to school and um, they were all with Mahayana professors. There's nothing wrong with that, except they insisted a lot of times to have Mahayana answers on all the tests. That's what happened to some of our students in Florida. And we had to struggle to help them to get credit for Theravada answers. So it was interesting. Okay. And then when I looked into it, I couldn't do, finish an undergraduate degree in Buddhism with anything connected with Theravada at that time back then. And so I decided um, maybe the best thing would be to assist Bhante as an attendant 
because Usilananda had had a woman as an attendant in the beginning when he was in West Coast and attendants are not involved with their teachers per se, like directly there, but they become drivers and servants and basically do all the things an attendant does all the things for the monk or monastic person that they can't do for themselves when they're fully ordained. That's what it's about. And so they handle reservations and traveling and driving and sorting out what's needed and making sure the person has everything they need as they go along. And that sounds small maybe, but it's not, it's consuming. And it's, it's uh, but at the same time, I looked at it this way. If I went back to college, I might see my professor, the one I really wanna to talk to once in a while. But if I'm in a truck and I'm driving across the country for 18,000 miles, I probably could have the person sitting about three feet away from me or in the back seat. And if I could ask them questions, I could learn that way. And at the time I had a disability that I was pulling out of and trying to come back into the world. And um, it wasn't easy. I knew it wouldn't be easy back to go back to school, but this seemed to solve the problem because he became a, sort of like a tutoring me while we were driving. And, and while we're driving, that's when I learned to memorize the first suited. That's when I learned the terms in Pali. That's when I started to learn the deeper part of the teaching and get interested in teaching myself because I could ask him, you know, can I ask a question? <laughs> and Usul Ananda met me before he died and he sort of smiled at Bhante and he said to him, I always told you, you always ask me so many questions. Someday, someone is going to show up who is going to ask you all the questions in the world. And here I was. <laughs> so that's, he used to say if they, I died and they buried me, he'd put uh, nothing on the tombstone except, excuse me, can I ask a question? <laughs> that's all that would be there. Anyway, and then Vanti began to teach meditation back in the US. So twin retreats seem to work especially well for peak meditation progress when you are introduced to a set of 10 topics woven together during your retreat. Now, I know over time, I've told you six or eight topics. And when I was doing research on this, going back over, I said, how do I forget about these other ones that were in there? Because the truth is, that is what we do. We take 10 topics, weave them together during your retreat. And they're interwoven in a way so that you don't feel like you're getting too much information because you're watching how they fit together very nicely. So Bhante Vimla Ramsey Mahatara worked carefully across the years to perfect teaching the 10 topics across the 10 day retreat. And they seem to come together, they work well. And when remembered by the student step by step, their progress advances. And it comes together similarly to a supporting causal line. Like in dependent origination, you have a causal line. Well, this is like a causal line of topics is the way it seems to work. To each advancing step happens naturally without tension or stress. And all of the topics are knowledge, uh, are building blocks that sharpen your observation and comprehension in the Dhamma as you, um, as you are going along. Now, in this brilliance of very clear teaching, always open for questions, it's always open for questions. It's like an evolving entity. It's like in Star Trek, you, find, you meet this entity out in space, but you realize it's not fully formed. This, this Dr. Spock says to Captain Kirk, it is an entity. However, it isn't fully formed. And it's it's forming all the time, learning from anybody it comes in contact with, from anything that happens in the retreats, from anything that goes wrong and a solution is found from, that's what dictates everything to us. It turns out Bhante Vimala Ramsey was attempting to recreate the Buddha's own pattern of investigation and his uncovering of the Four Noble Truths. His investigation was based on the Four Noble Truths. He wanted to know what is suffering, what is the cause of it, what is the cessation of it, and how can I create an evolving cessation of the suffering? That's what he was doing. 
So let's see, did he succeed? Only if you stay on track and stay close to the instructions without adding or subtracting anything. That's how you stay on track. And yes, it is just like a specific recipe with specific blending instructions. That is true. Many women have said that to me. I say it all the time. You can, I can tell you how to make French pastry, but if you don't follow the instructions precisely, the way you touch the dough, the way you roll it, how many times you press it or touch it in your hand, it can come out like shoe leather, or it can come out like the flakiest, most delicious light pastry that wraps up whatever is inside. The 10 Dhamma topics included by Bonte V. Lorenz's retreat, they went like this. Now, any of you can, I'm just gonna read through them. I'm not gonna talk about them really that much, but if you have questions, I'll go back to it. Um, the retreat day is on here. And then the first night, you can go in any retreat Bundy ever taught back to 2005. And the first night is going to appear kind of like this. You're thinking when you go in there, how is life working when you first begin your practice? And is it really possible for us to gain control over our habitual behavior patterns? You're thinking that maybe things went out of control in your life. And the answer is you can gain control, but how you have to start at the beginning. So what he tells you is he, he gives you, he, what he does is he, he starts out with what is a human being made up of, and he teaches you the five aggregates, body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. He then talks to you about each person has six sense doors. He tells you what they are, which means they have six forms of contact. And he talks about three kinds of feeling. This is enough. Then how are the five precepts related to the five hindrances? He gives you an example. He shows you the five precepts. You can do this yourself. And you look at the five hindrances on a page next to it. And you say, I just killed something. And you say, which of those hindrances are going to come up? It's not a one-to-one -one line from precepts to hindrances like that. It's like you can have sloth and torpor come up and not be able to sleep or think in class because you did something wrong in the morning before you left the house. Um, you can have restlessness, guilt, and remorse also happening outside of the sloth and torpor at the time that you actually did the act that was against the precepts. Uh, when you did that, you had lust and greed or hatred and aversion in your mind. This is how it works. And you start to look at how they're interrelated. It's like a weaving. We want you to do that. Then what is the Buddhist meditation for? It's a good question. And I think this last year, I boiled it down to saying that the Buddha actually he wouldn't have said it then maybe, but he figured out a way where it's a communication system that you are reconnecting for the human being inside learning how to have your mind follow the intention. So you have an intention, will mind follow that intention? And learning how to do that is what this is about that changes your life and how things actually work and operate is the knowledge that sets you free. So what is Buddhist meditation for? It's for connecting this communication system between mind and actions, verbal and physical actions. And what is mindfulness? We take mindfulness to a different place from the sterilized mindfulness in MBSR. It's different. It's outside of, of the actual Buddhist way it was happening. The, the Mindfulness meant a form of special kind of observation that you do in a concentrated way in your sessions, but you learn to keep it going outside your sessions. And how are these two related? Mindfulness uh, it has no purpose if you're not running this meditation all the time or when you're sitting and, and meditation, it doesn't work without having this kind of observation going. So they have this kind of conjoined piece together 
where they, they support each other. So that's how they're related and why practice this is a big question for some people. We have talked about Sila Samadhi Panya so hard in the Buddhist world. We have forgotten that the most successful person practicing Sila Samadhi Panya is the person who first practiced Dana Sila Bhavana. So the generosity, the reason for the Dana is to open the heart, to get it comfortable with opening because it has to be comfortable opening for successful meditation and the shila is protecting you from the distractions stopping this realization stopping your observation so the first bhavana or development of is development of the shila and the generosity and then in shila when you say shila samadhi panya that shila is incorporating dana and sila together samadhi is calming the mind so that you can observe longer periods of time of observation to see how things are working and development of mind so it's development of mind and development of behavior patterns and dr per uh, premisiri at uh, Paradinia University came up with that definition. He's the head of the poly department there. And he, he said, most people say development of mind only, not understanding if mind is the forerunner of all states and actions, then it must also be the development of behavior patterns. So the second day when you're in the retreat, what happens is you have a lesson a lesson on the um, on the hindrance management because that's the main concern when you first start out your practice. What was the Buddhist predominant? We're interested in. We were interested most in discovering in using the Majjhima Nikaya. We were interested to just use that book when Bhante taught because that was the book that he found what he needed to understand this. Okay. And we were interested in the beginning to only use that book, which wasn't hard because Samyutta Nikaya had not been translated yet and, and, and Gutra Nikaya were, was not there yet. Okay, so it wasn't a problem. But the reason for mastering, why would I say it's still important to use Majima Nikaya by itself first was because um, the Majjhima Nikaya, according to Bhikkhu Bodhi, has the entire complete teachings in the Majjhima Nikaya, okay? And the Samyutta Nikaya and Gutra Nikaya are additional supports for what's in that book. But if you take additional supports or tips about stuff without learning the main source first and solidifying your practice very strongly, you might not understand these tips or, or go in a wrong direction when you haven't mastered the principal parts of a good meditation practice. And this is what he was very profound with me about when I was training to only work with the no books at all for the first year and just listen to the talks and practice and listen and write notes and, and practice. So I wasn't allowed to have any books for one year and I surrendered to that. <laughs> I was allowed to have only a dictionary and thesaurus where if I, he started saying certain words, I could look up uh, the other words for that to get very clear what he meant. But I was only allowed to do that uh, that way. And then after that, I was allowed to work with pamphlets, small pamphlets that year and small kind of booklets if I got stuck on a question and he didn't want to answer it, he wanted me to read the pamphlet or read the booklet and come back and discuss it until I had the answer. And I, I had to practice and show him how I practiced to discover the meaning of each thing. So I was encouraged to ask questions all the time. <laughs> Some people say you always had something to say. Yeah, well, I did because I had lots of questions and I just kept asking questions. I'm sure it annoyed a lot of people, but I was under direction to keep asking questions. And I probably did too much of it, I admit. So, but I did learn an awful lot. 
And so here, how do you how do you deal with somebody like him in the car next to you for 16,000 miles? I mean, would you not ask him questions? Come on. So basic path knowledge is the third day. And path knowledge means you are reviewing the mental states we pass through as we move down the path to experience Nibbana. Now, I want you to understand this only reason for Anupada Sutta is why do you go to the AAA Automobile Club before you go on your summer trip and get the map for the most recent roads and paths that are working best to get you from point A to point B. You get the triptych, and this is like a triptych explaining uh, what is going to happen when you do path knowledge, okay? Hindrance management what we were doing was the second day, we looked very careful at the predominant, the most predominant position we found on the management of distractions during meditation that the Buddha taught. What did he teach his monks? And they were the primary people that he was teaching the advanced. What did he tell them to help them to reach Nibbana the fastest they could? What did he do? And it all revolved around abandonment. And over time, that got overturned. And I'm just doing research now, going back into the Vasudhimaga to try and figure out how it happened. But Vasudhimaga, by the way, is not a bad book. It is not a totally wrong book. We do not condemn the Vasudhimaga. I need to say this a lot this year because somewhere, someone started saying we did and it's just not true. Okay, the only thing we ever said about this is um, it caused problems for people in the time when it was written, when the academics were becoming more stronger than the meditators. And the preservation was changed from oral presentation to written presentation. There was no problem with oral preservation. You, the stuff can't get changed when there's 800 monks that have to agree that you're saying a sutta the right way. It's going to stay the same, trust me, because you're not ever going to bed when it's your turn and you make a mistake and I raise my hand. You know, nobody's going to bed until the person who's reciting it has it perfect again that night. And they were preserving the stuff in a different kind of oral tradition than we think about, oh, oral tradition, that couldn't be accurate. Well, there were 800 monks at Askiri in, in Kandy in Sri Lanka, and their job was to preserve 50 of the 152 suttas in the Majima Nikaya. And there was another monastery that existed with 800 for the next 50 suttas, and another one with 800 uh, monks in it to preserve the last 52. And that's how it used to operate. And that isn't done anymore because of books and printing. And all we have to do is look at six or seven different translations to see what happens when you're working with writing stuff down. And things get changed very easily because nobody's around to say no. You see, it's very different. And so what happened was even today, uh, the ac academics get far more credibility and majesty than the meditators. And the meditators way back, they stayed in the forest. But eventually they creeped out and said, hey, hello, when this 1200 years back or so, uh, the Vasudhimaga was written, and then it started to come out. Why did it get so powerful was because it was the way it was written was so organized. It's like a Boy Scout manual or a Girl Scout manual. It's just so organized. It looks like, hey, you know, this must be it. And let's use this. And then everybody decided we will use this and that's it without question. But without question is kind of a no-no with the Buddha. This is a big deal. He was known to ask monks to leave his school of meditation, which is what he was moving around India, a school of meditation with all his monks and people who came to train. And you can leave if you're not going to practice the way I tell you to practice. And I want you to practice knowing things only by seeing them for yourself. I don't want you to ever teach unless you've experienced that topic yourself. I don't want you to uh, 
just say, you know, it's this way or give an answer, dance around a question and not answer. So when we started with teachers wanting to happen, we tried that routine, it doesn't work today, but um, we thought we'll just tell them. And so in the initial part, we said, please don't teach anything that you have not experienced for yourself and don't teach until you're very secure in the whole pattern of this retreat. We tried that, okay. And then the next thing that we tried was the only other request we had was because of the way things were going around internationally with teachers that were getting started, just getting started. We ask them, if people ask you a question, we want our teachers to be able to say, I don't know. And when you say, I don't know, you also tell them, I will find out and I will come back and tell you. And then we want you to do it. Well, I didn't go over too well either. <laughs> yeah. It's like um, too many people were exposed to teach big teachers and not saying anything or asking any questions. And too, there was too much in it, where I am, there's too much of, and the guru said, and then you don't ask questions, you just go home and consider what the, boot, the guru said until you got it maybe. And, but you don't really spend a lot of question, question, question. You bring a question, get an answer, go home. And that's not what was going on with the way the Buddha was working his school. He was an activist. Shh. He was a renegade. Shh. <laughs> he was going to do things differently because what he discovered was very different. Okay. So the next thing that happens here after path knowledge, we're telling you to look at your triptych. And, the, and what we mean is uh, this, the, the path, it consists of um, eight levels that you pass through. And these jhanas are gradual levels of cessation of craving and clinging that go deeper as we move towards the complete destruction of the taints. And the best description we have of this sitting and being aware of watching how these are each happening in a complete version of someone from the beginning to the end is in Anupada. So we go back and use it as a way to check out the factors that you start with, the factors that leave and other factors that come up in the second jhana, and then which ones fall away and the third and what new ones come up. And that's how that is set up. Next one is Satipatthana. And most people who have been practicing know sati, sati practice is very important as a method of practice for investigation of um, of the uh, of the body and feeling and mind and dhammas and that method that satipatthana sutta the, the different exercises in it are continually trying to show you the impersonal nature of everything and that's what needs to be emphasized in that and remembering when you're practicing the sati practices, okay, you remember carefully that mind is the forerunner of all states. And you see if you can notice if the mind does something first before there is action, either uh, verbal or physical action that follows or mental observation that follows. So this technique has to be mastered but the way we approach the hindrances um, are, is a bit different because of how many of the suttas that were about hindrances all advocated abandonment as the, de the, the destination for management of hindrances, is complete abandonment of them and non-concern. And the reason we find out that about the hindrance is because what is the nutriment for the hindrance? What keeps it going, what gives it energy, what makes it return, what makes it get bigger, my personal attention on it. Removing that is like cutting off the supply chain for the army so they can't attack you. It's simple. Okay, the middle way of learning the process of human cognition is what I put here because what we're showing you is um, a phenomenological observation of the process of 
dependent origination. Phenomenological is precisely what it appears. It's a big word. Phenomeno means the phenomenon arises and passes away. And the logical action of that phenomena that arises and passes away is what you want to come to understand is an impersonal process of the human being's cognition. So human cognition is equivalent to dependent origination or the um, codependent arising, like some of the professors like to call it. The anatta teaching is the impersonal nature of everything. And I usually tell people, just go listen to 148 and then listen to 148 and then listen to 148. And if you keep listening to it, um, you're going to start to sink into understanding the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape of all arising phenomena. That is how you examine closely how suffering happens the same way every time, the components of its occurrence. Seventh day, Noble Eightfold Path, um, completed in the practice of TWIM. Uh, you can find this in these noted areas, 117.3, Majima Nikaya 141.23, uh, Majima Nikaya 3, section 8 through 15, are pretty good ways of grasping the Eightfold Path pretty deeply in the, in the Majima Nikaya. The eighth uh, way is the eighth day Buddha's version of understanding emptiness. This is an interesting phenomenon people like to look on is because there are schools of emptiness saying that Nibbana is the emptiness and, and um, it's on the way to it, but it's not the same as what we find the actual spirit experience of Nibbana is leading to and what's happening in the brain when that happens. So this one clears up if you read Majima Nikaya number 121 carefully, 122, it, 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 start, it starts to understand that emptiness isn't empty <laughs> and that emptiness was a bad trade-off. That word empty was a bad trade-off for being void of one thing and having another thing present. And in the end, whatever you are void of is gone and whatever is there is present. And that's as far as the Buddha went with that. So it's interesting to spend time with that one. And then question and answer suttas for more advanced students. We look at a group as we're teaching, we decide whether they're ready to listen to the questions and answers that appear in 43 and 44. These are questions most practitioners have wanted to ask for a long time. And no one has given answers to these things or just sloughed them off and not given answers. So going back to the text and finding out that the monks were working in groups according to their advancement and one group was questioning another group and it was their turn to answer is how this one is set up. The other one is um, a bakuni who is answering the questions that her ex-husband is bringing to her and he is less uh, at a lesser level than she is when she's answering the questions. And that's a very interesting one. And that one is in 44. The 10th day, we end the retreat and, and on, we actually are giving you eight of these. Um, and then you add in the first day. So it's nine of them. And the last one we give at closing time is it's number 21, the Kakachupama Sutta. And what it is, the closest thing we were able to find that is actually giving a measurable outcome, expectant measured outcome of your meditation practice. If you practiced it the way the Buddha was teaching, you should have these results and it describes the results that should be happening for you in your life. And it's very succinct, it's very precise, 
and it's showing you what should be fading away and how things should be working. So as I was working with Bon TV Miller Ramsey over the past 20 years, I realized the brilliance that this teacher is in presenting the order of the Buddhist teaching. Um, and when completed like this, in this kind of order, it's easily followed uh, that with very good results, the, you could feel the progress happening. You could feel the opening, the re relaxing and tranquilizing of mind and body, opening of mind, more energy, happier disposition, releasing attention and tightness uh, in a great deal, if not completely going through uh, to experience Nibbana, people were definitely increasing the sitting times and observation and interest was increasing in their practice each time we held retreats. And so it becomes like a causal line. And the Buddha graded the progress of his own monks from poor or excellent as they were developing their knowledge and practice. And we can find remarks about that in the Digha Nikaya in, in Sutta number 28, section 10. And when they develop uh, this parallel teaching of meditation and comprehension of the Dhamma simultaneously, they reach excellent progress. That's what we were interested in. Our predominant, uh, we, we understand the importance of reaching the final super mundane Nibbana, but more important for this world right now is reaching the change that happens from shifting a person through metta from ill will into um, acceptance and, 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 and a metta lets go of the ill will. And the karuna is letting go of the cruelty, cruel thoughts. And the mudita is letting go of just discontent, 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 personal discontent all the time of everything. And then the last one is as your equanimity grows stronger and stronger and starts to bloom, aversion is falling away and away and away and away, less and less. And you are able to accept things. Why do you think you're able to accept them? It's simple. It's because if you accept them, you are beginning to embrace anicca. Anicca is acceptance of everything that arises, passes away. And it's the acceptance of uh, the acceptance of, um, uh, of everything changes. And so why get upset with something if it's going to change all the time? That's one of the things. Why get upset about it? Yeah? Okay. So then, let's see where I am here. Okay. I can't find my cursor. I think I'm, cur oh, there I see it. Okay. Okay. I think I'm going blind. <laughs> That's an interesting thing. Okay. They were developing knowledge and practice. They developed the parallel teachings, the meditation and comprehension of the Dhamma. Simultaneously, they reach an excellent level of progress. That's what's happening. That's all that's happening. Now, either it happens for a student or it doesn't. If it doesn't happen, there are side effects that can happen in this meditation. And you know what? There are side effects that can happen in all meditation, all kinds of meditation. If you apply too much pressure on the brain in concentration and determination to make the progress happen, you'll get a headache. You get a headache. You get a headache here. You get a headache down through here. Stop it. Step back. That's not the instructions. There's nothing that says work really, really hard. In our retreats, the basic construct of our retreats was structured in denying that sort of thing. 14 to 16 hours of working, of, of sitting in meditation and then walking in addition to that and being forced to sleep only two hours. If you want to have anything forced like that, where the teacher is encouraging you constantly for getting your sleep down to six hours, four hours, two hours, go to Burma. Go ahead, go to Burma. This is just a known thing. This is not, I'm not being facetious saying this or vicious or anything else. This is a known fact. Does our sleep reduce out? Yes, it does. By request of the teacher? No, it doesn't. 
It reduced, mine reduced from 10 hours where the doctors had told me when I began uh, doing meditation years ago, I had had a stroke. I had had a, a breakdown that was very serious and a stroke that occurred from the medication that was given to me. And it was messy, <laughs> messy situation. And when I came out, I had problems with uh, cognition and I definitely had exhaustion easily coming up. And I definitely was told you need to remember 10 hours of sleep. Well, that 10 hours, when I started doing meditation, the higher my energy got, actually the less I needed to sleep and the clearer my mind became. And when the, when the, future stuff, fear of the future in this situation with the condition, fear of it disappeared, that weight went off and letting go of the story of the past, just letting go of the whole thing, experimenting with that left me here. And that's all in the present time with what I tried to do in present time situations. No one told me I had to be in the present moment. We never talked about the present moment. Advanced students can talk about actually seeing the present moment, but not a beginner. And there's no reason they should try to. We have a very bad situation of competition, and it's mean in this country. In, uh, over here, we find it some, but not quite as much. But in the West, we find a terrific amount of competing to make something happen. And when we go to make something happen in this practice, nothing happens, which is where I will tell people in a treat, uh, that's a really important point to grasp right away. If you want it, try to push, try to force it to happen, it won't happen. So if you want it, you can't have it. <laughs> so I want that candy. No, you can't have it. The dentist said no. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's like we can pinpoint a lot of the difficulties people have. So in the case of anyone saying something terrible happened to me, you know, I was so exhausted and I had to push. No one told you to. The instructions are very, very succinct. They take 12 minutes to give in the short version and they take 30 minutes to give in the full meta booklet, you can go to the website, find the meta booklet, listen to the 30 minute presentation, and then listen to it again, take notes and listen to it again, till you get all the points. In that uh, booklet, which took a long time to develop, he did that himself. And the booklet is him presenting verbatim, recorded and written down precisely the way he gave it and still does from memory has all these little tiny points in it. When you sit, don't move. It means you can move as much as this little Buddha up here and that's it. <laughs> you know, you used to like that one, you know. And do not, do not scratch, do not itch, do not shift your position at all. You may shift your position once if you wish in the time that you're sitting. Don't move. If somebody comes and they have a habit of shaking, that's your responsibility. Stop shaking. <laughs> okay. That's don't don't blame this on your brain and everything and say, I have no control because I am not here. I am non-self. No, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> if you do that, your ship is still out there floating and it will never come to port. Each one of us has a ship, and we get to learn that we can steer that ship. We have accepted way too long that anything that happens with us that makes us uncomfortable is happening to us. And the Buddha comes along and says, oh, no, nothing's happening to you. Everything's happening from you. And he expects you to figure out what that means. So that has to do with how you look at what's occurring. The car just um, caught fire. I had to get out, honey, and it just burned up in front of me. Okay, fine. It's flat tire. I'm on the road. I haven't got any power in my phone. Well, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, you have to figure out how to thumb a ride to get somebody to help you get some gas or something. You can use your phone and wave it around, you know, like we can go like this. Ah! <laughs> 
like Claudette Colbert in a famous film. I can't remember who the was playing the part for the male. She he tried and tried to get her a car to jump in because their truck broke down. And she said, okay, okay, I know you think women can't do anything. And she just went out there and she raised her skirt up so she could see her knees. And then she sort of just got a leggy position and she went, and the first car stopped and they got in and went to get help. <laughs> so the thing is, we are learning how to deal with creating uh, this communication system in our mind. And once we have it going, we can say that we can, I would like to sit no higher than the first jhana. We can't say, I want to sit in the first jhana now. We can't say, I will sit in the first jhana now, like an order, which I guess we cannot order the brain at all. It's just waiting to hear something of an intention. I will sit no higher than the third jhana. You just had an accident. You would like to lose the feeling in your body and not feel so much pain. You would like to allow your body to start healing as successful as possible. And so you say, I will sit no higher, higher than the third jhana. And 90% plus, 90 plus percent of the time, that's where the mind will go. No higher than the third. And you can lose the feeling in your body and be there for quite calmly till they come and get the whatever's on top of you, off of you and get you in an ambulance or help you in a car wreck or help you when you're trying to get up. I remember I fell once and I thought, <laughs> it was funny. I thought the best thing is to just go to sleep on the floor. It was dark, I slipped and I fell. The dog was there. I didn't want to yell at the dog. I didn't have any energy. I had gotten up to help the dog. It was very funny. And then <laughs> I decided the best thing in this case is go to sleep right here on the floor and then get up when the light comes, figure out how to get up off the floor. It wasn't too bad. I dislocated my shoulder and cracked my rib and got a headache. <laughs> you know, but you know, this is life. So. <laughs> You can bet your bottom dollar I don't get up anymore at night like that, though I can tell you right now. So any questions about this whole thing leads, when you're practicing this way, the student to fully realize the Four Noble Truths. This is your goal in the practice. This is your goal down here. Whether you reach Nibbana, the experience of Nibbana or not, this is the goal of the meditation in general. You are trying to fully realize the Four Noble Truths, the phenomenological understanding of dependent origination, and the very clear internalizing of the three characteristics of existence by the end of each retreat. And those three characteristics are Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta. I put a nata in caps because the nata is the escape. You flip your switch and stop looking at everything as if it's happening to you and decide for a fact everything that's happening. It has, has not, it was not there in your mind. Now it's arising. It is in your mind. Now it's happening. And then it passes away. Do you see that? That's what Sariputta was trying to tell you. Everything that arises happens the same way like that. It wasn't there. It comes up. It exists and passes away. And it's all very impersonal. And the more you, you practice, the more you see everything is happening the same way. So you say, okay, fine. If I don't like it, give it 10 minutes. It's going to change for real. Okay, <laughs> that's how it works. So I'm going to go out of here now. You got any questions about this? Hmm? Questions? May. Hmm? Hmm? Any uh, questions? Not really a question, Mr. Kema, but thank you very much uh, for summarizing it all very concisely uh, for us. Um, one, one of the things, it's 
it's more of a comment or actually it can also be a question. Um, a thought occurred to me a couple of weeks ago. So if, uh, if a person has never gone through at least an online retreat, doesn't matter if the person has um, knowledge in Buddhism or does not have knowledge in Buddhism. But if that person had never gone through this structure, at, even at least via an online retreat, it would be very difficult for them to understand the, um, yeah, the, the teachings that we go through. Am I right? No. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Well, I thought about that. I did. I did. And let me go back for just a second here to this um, to see if I can go back to it. Uh, right. If we look at this. Um, remember, I said it was like a causal relationship. And what we're interested in the retreat, I'm being very forward about this now because of the, the nuns that I talked and they had a high rate of going through and opening their minds, very high rate. Out of 16, there were 10 experiences with nine people. That's a remarkable rate of success going through and having an experience like that. They didn't know what they were experiencing and I didn't tell them. The only thing I told them was they were rebooting their brain. They were rebooting their computer, that their, their minds, they came up with this themselves. Their minds were like computers where they were having a great deal of difficulty. And, and um, when the, the experience happened, the, I went through witnessing the same thing I would witness you if you went through for the first or second time with your facial change and your, uh, your movement change and your sixth sense enhancement and all of that and the energy change in you and your voice change. I saw everything the same way, but we may, I made a decision that this wasn't going to be about uh, Buddhism as much that retreat as it was going to be about what is happening to the brain and how does this affect me and how does it help me and change the way I live, you see? So even without going through that experience, what happened to the ones who didn't go through? They went from 30 minutes to two, three, and four hours of sitting. That's amazing. And they were perfectly calm, and their sleep was reducing out, and they were stabilizing from what was being taught. So the reason I took you back here is look at this part is sort of the framework of how you are operating, okay? If we look at the next one, that prepares you to look now that you understand how you experience stuff through the sixth sense doors, how three kinds of feeling comes up and the aggregates play with you in, the, in how the suffering happens with craving and clinging, okay? It takes, he takes you that far. You listen to one of the first talks you'll hear. Then you're ready to hear hindrance management. They learned about hindrance management. They didn't go through, but they learned about hindrance management and it changed everything for their practice very quickly by the fourth and fifth day of nine days, this was happening. They were, and they were increasing their sitting at 30 minutes each day. This is something else was a trial. It was a test run to see with um, a group like that. If I asked them to do 30 minutes more each day, could they do that? The first time I asked them for 10 minutes and when they all did that, I asked them 30 minutes more each, day, each time you sit, they did that. The trick to these people was clearly they're going to follow the instructions precisely. They're going to listen intently and give total ear to this teaching. When they hear it, they're going to take notes and ask questions. And they did it all through the retreat. It was a divine experience. <laughs> you know, they were speaking English and I was speaking English. It was really fun that way. Okay. Now the, the Satipatthana reviewing what that was and the test of this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. And realizing everything is impersonal when you're practicing with um, body feeling mind and dhammas in your investigation. And then once you got that going, then you go 
to the middle way of learning human cognition. Now you're just learning a chart. And this is how the human beings operate. And you're teaching them human cognition. We didn't even call it dependent origination. We just said, this is human cognition. This is how the human being cognizes their experience. Let's see if you can see how it works as if it is a movie happening in front of you. Let's look at the individual frames of the movie and see if you can see where and why the craving happens and the suffering starts. And they identified it. They identified it very clearly. Once they did that, they were willing, they were very ready to see the reason that happened was because of Atta. And here was Anatta in a very, you've listened to this, I know, probably a number of times. And this one is a drill for you to go around practicing for yourself as far as the I and forms and eye consciousness, bringing eye contact, and with eye contact as condition, eye feeling occurs, with eye feeling as condition, eye craving occurs, with eye craving as condition, eye clinging, and they're beginning to see it and talk to me about it in their interviews, and these people had never meditated before, only one or two, one or two, one person had one Goenka retreat five years before, and the others had no meditation at all. No meditation. They're all Catholics. They all didn't have meditation. They had prayer, personal prayer. But their personal prayer was very disappointing to them. And most of them didn't have any more than 40 minutes max ever happen for them in their personal prayers. At the end of this, they could sit for one, two, three, four hours if they had the time to do it without any problem. The Eightfold Path made perfect sense to them when we looked at the five precepts and the Eightfold Path, it was like looking at the Ten Commandments and living in the, walking the line with the Lord in Christianity. And it made perfect sense for them that they would be able to do these other things and they would all blend together and work to support each other, see? It's hard to see the causal relationship in this the way I'm trying to explain it to you, unless you're teaching all the time. And then you see retreat after retreat after retreat after retreat working the same way towards progress. When a person makes good progress and you question them, you find out why. I never understood what this was for, Satipatthana. I never understood why we should even look at dependent origination. They never even thought of looking at it. It was so complex. After all, it was so heavy and difficult. But we made it easy to remember. We had to work a long time to make it easy to remember. And then Anatta, the idea was so dreadful to them because they were a child of God uh, by design, a uh, being made by God. And that child of God shouldn't be deserved. It, that personality, that self was them, who they were. And they had to let go of that part and say, what if, what, just pretend there isn't a self. If there was no self, what would be the consequence of that? I wouldn't have to take anything personally, they said. They said, I didn't say, they said. And then I said, let's go through the rest of the retreat looking at the idea of not taking anything that happens or mistakes we make or things we do in the kitchen or dropping something or anything else is not personal. It's just an event that starts and happens and passes away. We took everything. They were, they were uh, living uh, as a group. They still had to do their kitchen chores and working while they were doing their retreat on top of sitting six hours a day, they were doing it. Everything I asked them to do, they did. That was the secret to this retreat. And the Noble Eightfold Path was equivalent for them. Uh, the precepts and the Noble Eightfold Path put them, they carried the precepts into the Eightfold Path and said the results of living the precepts is like the results of living the commandments brings us onto the um, walking the line with God. And I'm, that's right. That's right. I had enough Christianity to understand where they were. That was one of the good things here, I guess, you know, but the Buddhist version of understanding emptiness, we even did that because they wanted to understand that they had heard about that emptiness. Are we actually working with emptiness? Well, are we? 
And then when we read that sutta, they're all like, wow, there's something left. So he didn't teach emptiness, did he? And they thought emptiness was a bad thing and he taught it. That was bad. It was wrong. Buddha was bad. When they figured out that he wasn't teaching emptiness, it was a big impact on them. He was just scientifically saying when something isn't here, it's gone. But that doesn't mean what's left is not present. And that's what we're finding out in space now. Yeah. We're finding out there is wind in space and you can sail a ship in space. We're finding out that there is something intelligent in space and there's no such thing as a vacuum. We're finding out all kinds of things now that he was talking about, the Buddha was talking about. And then the Buddhist method of uh, measuring this, of course, this group of nuns, they were connected with, um, right, St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis of Assisi was this loving person who developed this high frequency of metta and had all the animals sitting next to him if he sat on the ground, etc. And they understood this very clearly, see? So... The question is, if a person doesn't go through Nibbana, do they make a kind of progress? And Bhante Dhammagavesi and I are very firm about this. The progress you make in your retreat that is the most important part is your development of understanding the Dhamma as you go through the, de- the, the gradual, te- this is a gradual teaching, a gradual knowledge, and a gradual practice okay yeah uh yeah. sorry sister Kema. i think if i can rephrase my my question mm-hmm. uh, so, um, what i was trying to say is not necessarily a person has to go through and experience nibbana at least one time but that they have gone through this structure of learning so if i may use an analogy just because i teach piano so Mm -hmm. because i i teach let's say um not just how to read notes but i teach scales i teach studies um i teach sight reading etc and then the, the the student understands that um, knowledge of learning piano and developing the technique and skill is beyond just reading the notes versus uh, another way of teaching where they can only read notes and uh, play on the, uh, you know, the correct notes. So I'm, it's not a very good analogy, but what I'm trying to get at is this structure of 10 days, if I may suggest, is effective in getting through the the core essence of what the Buddha taught versus um, another structure which you probably get a feel of it if if that's correct that's right see the big the big thing that I think that uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey accomplished was I have spoken to monks and there some have gotten very upset about this uh, this plan and this retreat line and had discussions with me. You can't teach them. They won't understand this. Why? Because they're not smart enough to understand this stuff. You see, the academic community has brainwashed the monks a lot that they are able to do this, but nobody else is able to do it. That's a problem. It's a it's a mindset. Okay, now when I went on contrary to that, when I was in, in Siba, in uh, Palakeli in Sri Lanka, the headmaster of that college, he was starting a master's program. And when he started the master's program, I was there when it first began. And when we sat down, he said, now, for those of you who are choosing a uh, master's thesis topic, your topics will no longer be accepted in this school unless you can show how they are actually useful for people in the community to use. And they all just went, <laughs> it's like It's like the English uh, major in the university, you needed a thesis topic. And he chose the, uh, the impact of the letter A on the English language. A and the, you know, A, the, the, the impact of the letter A, in the English language and they just take that and they let him have a thesis and it went in a box and nobody ever saw it again ever 
It wouldn't affect the world. It wouldn't do anything for anybody. But because he was able to lay his paper out with a one and a 1.1 1 .1 and a 1.2 and a two and a 2.1 and a two point, we was able to do. So that's all he really learned. What did it prove to the world? Absolutely nothing. Was it true fact? Yeah, it was true. And they felt they couldn't tell him he couldn't do it. But this headmaster was adamant in Buddhism. He, it hit him that year that when you choose a master to work on for the next couple of years here, you can only do it if it's going to be able to be used by the common person and make a difference for them in life. Well, that's kind of how uh, this is the pro I wish the monks who, who argued this with me and I challenged them, come and take a retreat. But they won't do it, they won't do it, no. And they're adamant that you see, my, why am I so into that is because of the 72-year-old woman I met in Anurodhapura in 2012 when I was there. And I went to the Bhikshu University, the first world conference they had, and I presented dependent origination. And they were like, oh, wow, it's a usable thing in life. It shocked them. It did. It shocked them. Now, when we were walking around the ruins, there were lots of people up there. It was in April and I don't know, some kind of holidays. And there were thousands of people. And a woman walks up to me and she comes up to me and says, please, I am the leader of these 40 women who are behind me in white. We would like you to come and teach us the Dhamma. I wasn't prepared to teach them the Dhamma because I was getting ready to fly back to the United States a week later. A very sad situation. But it's what she said to me that impacted me for the next 15 years, okay? And what she said was, I, I said, why do you think that I would be able to teach you the Dhamma when you are 72 years old and you grew up here in Sri Lanka and you're Buddhist and you're telling me you don't know the Dhamma, you see? And she looked me in the eye and she said, I'm 72 and I was brought to the temple every single Sunday of my life. My husband died in the war, my father, my sons, my brothers, they're all dead and gone. We are all widows. All we want to know before we die is what did the Buddha teach? Because all we ever got was listening to our precepts and doing the puja and blessings for a holiday and that's all. And the, the, this is the people saying this to me, not me. I had no position on this before this woman impacted me. And she wanted me to stay and teach her group. And I, I forget, you know, I, I just apologized. I couldn't do it. But that impacted me so hard that it became something I discussed with Bonte. But he was already there. He knew in Asia what was going on. And here, for instance, the idea of the Buddhists, uh, the children learn by parroting. They do not learn by understanding the meaning. And if you, you think that couldn't be true, you ask the older brothers or sisters or parents, they don't know what they're saying. And that's where it all stops. So is there something usable about it? No, they can't find it except to be calm and light a candle and say these things they parroted and learned by heart. And it's not that that's nothing. It's just that look at what the gift actually was and how they really could have helped them beyond just sitting and being quiet and weeping at what happened and still carrying the burden of the suffering and not understanding even the lesson on past and future and present time. Nothing, nothing, nada, you see? So we are the breakers of the rules. Bhante Bimala Ramsey and myself were the breakers of the rules. <laughs> you know, we dared to read the suttas. And the teachers coming in, I, I'm not saying that there's, there, there's something wrong with the teachers. I'm saying they're taking Bhante's talks and they're playing the talks and then they're running retreats and they do service and they do learn it's true it's true all of it yeah but what will happen to the idea that monastics should be reading them bunty is reading them to you i'm reading them to you bunty dhamma gavesi thank goodness because in many traditions the monk is not to read them to the person i've heard enough of that 
and it's just not real. So they memorize things uh, that they'll say in Pali, and that's good if they explain it and give good talks on that. I have been involved in some very good groups. I'm just saying the young monks, the middle-aged monks, know there's something odd going on, you see. They know that the people are smarter than the monks think they are. Now, why is it that they don't think they're smarter? That used to bug me. Why don't they think that you are smart enough to understand dependent origination? Because they didn't get married. They didn't have kids. That's where I go with this. <laughs> and they didn't find out how smart kids are and grow up and how much they can learn on the computer and listen to everything and everything else. I mean, you have no idea. Bhante and I went to the World Conference in 2007, but then we went again in, I think, nine or something like that. We went to four of them. And the second one we went to, uh, the first one, we had only one request, that all 40 countries could come to an agreement that they would say the Four Noble Truths the same way. And they thought it was ridiculous, the request. And I, at first I was upset, but then I thought, wait a minute, this is because they don't know the difference between all of life is suffering and there is suffering in life is two different things. It's because of English as a second language that that whole problem arose. And the majority of them did not understand in earnest, they're not being funny or just mean to object and put us down. They didn't understand that there's a difference in those two setups that I show you about the Four Noble Truths, okay? And um, the second time we went, we suggested to them, well, we, we told them, we told them that our whole center was based on computer development and bringing people to learn the Dhamma on computer and then coming to the center. And they poo pooed us and poo pooed us and said, that will never work. Well, that was before there were any other, anybody else was out there putting up their Dhamma talks and building uh, Dhamma rooms, you know, like, uh, like meditation rooms online and all that stuff started to happen. And by the next uh, four years later, they had to just eat those words because everybody there, if you, they, if they became, they began to realize if you don't have something on the internet, you don't exist. <laughs> you see, it's like, if you're not on the internet, your organization isn't real and it's not not level, it's, it's fake or something. If it doesn't have a home on the internet, actually UIBDS never became an internet site. That's one of the reasons nobody knows about it. <laughs> you know, they know about Dhammasukha Meditation Center because Dhammasukha Meditation Center had the website I built and it started to exist. But UIBDS didn't have its own website. So someone would question, what is that about? You see, it's crazy but they're not aware of what is keeping up with. And now they're getting better. They're getting better. I'll say that. They're getting better and more people are coming to help them to build and to um, use the tools that we have the, these days to do this. But you see how it works? Yeah. So it's... Um, Sister Kim, again, I just wanted to point it out the time. It is almost five. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to point out it is almost five now. <laughs> you should shut me down, you know. <laughs> All right, you should really shut me down. Okay. Anyway, you have to do something with getting some of this <laughs> off of this, okay? Cut it, just cut it off. But but honestly, my thing after going through raising the five kids and everything, and if, if, the, if, the, if the monks don't have children, they came up, they grew up with big families sometimes, it's true. But if they weren't there for everybody growing all the way up with um, people who are into the digital age, in the computer age, they're not familiar with the fact of what's really going on. And this is a, this is, this is a serious problem of understanding. But I liked what you were talking about because you're talking about the pedagogy, right? You're talking about not teaching somebody to sing, but teaching, teaching them the pedagogy that goes with singing or, or operating the wind instrument or the brass instrument or the wood, wood instrument and stuff. Yeah, that's exactly it. Without the pedagogy, you've only got half the story. Yeah. And what we're trying to do is show you a taste of the pedagogy and then 
have you put it into practice and use it while you're learning it and hopefully get you to the point where you want to drive home and use it while you're driving home <laughs> and keep smiling no matter what happens on the la freeway keep smiling <laughs> okay so we're okay here yeah anybody else have a question yeah <laughs> ever left me he just turned on the sand painting and that was it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I wrote this whole I wrote this whole thing for you, Everett, and then I ended up using it for class. <laughs> I, I Everett wrote me a note about references, and I think this is great. I'm gonna try to figure out how to do references better, but those two documents came through as a corruption. I couldn't open them. I could only open the comic strip, which was the one I really wanted anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good comic. He sent me a Dutch comic strip. That's <laughs> very good. Anyway, let's say a prayer. <laughs> May suffering ones be Some suffering ones free be suffering and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I have to find my bell. It's one of the suitcases I still haven't found it. <laughs> no, I do. Wait, wait. I just wait. wait. Okay. <laughs> Still. I got it. I got it. I got it. I have a different bell. Yeah, I do. Um, oh, okay, here I go. I just never. There you go. No. <laughs> That's better. How does that one work? Does it hurt your ears? <laughs> no, it's, it's such a nice little bell. See that? It's just one little piece. It's good. Uh, this is the one from uh, Penang. I, 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 I gave you this bell, if you remember. This is from Penang. Yeah, that's right. From, from, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It was very cool. I found this one, but I don't know what happened to my baby bowl. I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> Oh, but I, I do have a new friend. I, I tell you guys, he'd make you smile for a whole week. Are you ready? <clears throat> I haven't named him. We need to come up with a name for him. But this is my new friend. So your new friend? A new friend? Oh, okay. I out the background. <laughs> oh. oh, wow. Uh, I'm a new friend. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi. Uh -oh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a second. Let's see if we can fix this. I, wait, this isn't going to work. Wait, this is not fair. Turn on the background. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Where's the background? Um, mm -hmm. uh, go to video and then uh, choose virtual background. Blur? Video. No, just, uh, just yeah, blur. Yes, yeah. No, 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 this is correct. Just, this is no, correct? No, 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 blur. This is correct. Uh, this is correct. Yeah. Right, okay. So this is something I got because I'm always going to stay at the hospital, the children's hospital. When I go down to Mumbai, I stay there, you know? And so um, I, um, wait a minute. Oh my gosh, I can't do this. And so I, wait a minute, there. Okay. And so I decided that I needed something to talk to the children because these children go there to get treatments, you know? And um, the treatments are IV treatments. So while I'm there, they're all going to get their IV drips. And sometimes it hurts when they put in the needles, but I can make them smile. You can? You can, you can make them smile? Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> it's wonderful. What's your name? I don't have a name yet. You don't have a name? Yeah, but you said I could stay here. I, yeah, I did. I said you could stay here. Want to give me a hug? Oh. <laughs> can I give you a hug? Yes, you can. Oh. Well, so he's my little friend, and um, I'll see you next time. I'll, I'll see you next time. Okay, bye. <laughs> so
so I, I love this guy. I have to tell you what happened. I went and I ate lunch in a mall. And then I came to this toy store and I went in to get the Hanley puppet because I saw they had some and I got this little puppet. And I didn't try the puppet in the store, but I told the lady I had them before. My dog ate them before, but we're, le we're keeping this in a safe place. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And so, and so I went downstairs to leave and wait for the taxi to come. And when I went to the front door, there was a furniture store and I sat down on a bench and pulled him out of the bag. Yeah, she did. <laughs> and, um, um, and I, and I, um, put, I made you move. Yeah, you did. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I, I started talking to it. And when I started talking to it, this older lady came up and says, does that puppet really talk? <laughs> and I said, you know, the thing about puppets, <laughs> puppets are whenever you put a puppet on your hand and you start doing stuff like this, it doesn't matter if my mouth doesn't isn't not moving. You are watching the puppet. When I ask the puppet a question, yeah, I ask you a question. Yeah, <laughs> ask you a question. Are you cute? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're watching the puppet when I ask the question. You are watching the puppet because I'm so cute. <laughs> I really am cute. <laughs> so I, this puppet and I are absolutely insane. The dog, my dog that's here, is very upset. He doesn't <laughs> understand this <laughs> puppet that showed up when I came home. It was really funny. I know, but you, you hate to Sadama. Mm -hmm. Is that why you're staying here with me? Yeah, I like the Dama. The Dama. Dama is everything. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, then. Bye. <laughs> so you all have a good week. Sister Kame is absolutely crazy, but that's the best thing in the world now. <laughs> okay, so just keep smiling and you'll do fine. Okay, bye-bye.